Thank you for joining us for an author's reading at All Saints of the North Shore's Perfect Paws Pet Ministry as we host author Peter Baggio, who will read delightful excerpts from his new book, A Dog's Life. Who would have thought that a book written by a veteran Broadway general manager about dead dogs could become <laughs> a must-have addition to one's library? Peter has an amazing ability to draw us into the eccentricities and imperfections that can universally touch us through vividly celebrating and honoring the dogs that have gone before us. <laughs> we don't live enough years to be good stewards of all the dogs that we want to love. So it's wonderful to hear about others' journeys. Virtually every animal lover who has been introduced to Peter's book has fallen in love with the dogs that he profiles with such warmth and grace and wit in this delightful, heartfelt tribute, celebrating a man and a woman's best friend. This sweet book has already garnered a slew of appreciative reviews from publications, including the Washington Post and the New York Post. The table of contents alone is enough to bring a smile and a tear to any pet lover's eye and is remarkably uplifting for a tome devoted to animals loved and lost. All Saints and its Perfect Paws Pet Ministry are delighted to welcome Peter to our first virtual author's reading. Welcome, Peter. Thank you, Maria, for that beautiful introduction and Fran for making this happen. I'm, I'm so thrilled to be here with you today and to share with you a combination book talk and reading. I'm going to talk a little bit about how this book came to be and some of the challenges I encountered while writing and try and intersperse that with some excerpts from the book. Um, to start off, I don't know whether it's 100% clear to everyone, but this is actually a book of dog obituaries. Uh, they are tributes to real dogs. They're all real dogs. And, and the form of the tribute is an obituary. But I tried to write about each dog with as much humor as I could and to celebrate their lives. So uh, I, I certainly hope no one will will find it depressing or morbid. That's, that's not the intention. But it is a book of dog obituaries. And um, many people have asked me, so how did you come to write a book of dog obituaries? Which is a very good question. And the answer is, um, it had never been my intention to do that. It was something of an accident. What happened was that my beloved dog died, my Scottish Terrier named Bilbo. And uh, as I'm sure all of you will understand and, and empathize with, um, you know, it was a devastating loss for my wife and myself. And uh, I felt the need to write about Bilbo and uh, to pay tribute to his life and his character, which was quite colorful. So I, I sat down to write an obituary uh, for him that, that I then plan to post on Facebook. This is um, a photo of Bilbo. Can you all, can you all see him? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so this is how the project started. I just, I just wanted to write about my own beloved dog. Bilbo Boggio. The McCracken Bodio family is deeply saddened to announce the passing of their beloved Scottish Terrier, Bilbo, on June 8th in Copake Falls, New York. The cause of death was bladder cancer. Bilbo was 10 or 70 years old, depending on your frame of reference. Born Lucky, that was his given name with a capital L, and Lucky in Bangor, Pennsylvania, the puppy was adopted by the McCracken Bodios at the age of 12 weeks. And shortly after relocating with them to the Big Apple, changed his name, as so many young hopefuls do, to Bilbo. 
Although plagued by trans stature issues his entire life, Bilbo, like any good terrier, always knew who he truly was and steadfastly identified as a big dog. Despite others insisting on seeing him as a stocky, stubborn little dog, his self-image never wavered. Outwardly short, he was known to be scrappy and walked with a pronounced swagger. If truth be told, he was a bit of a pub brawler. On the street, his nickname was the mayor. Adopted into an artistic family, Bilbo surprised everyone late in life when he was discovered by a park ranger slash talent scout from Hyde Park, New York, and tapped to portray the pivotal role of Fala in a recreation of the famous election night torchlight parade that started in the village of Hyde Park and ended at the doorstep of the Roosevelt homestead. His debut was universally acclaimed with rave reviews ranging from the Hudson Valley Chronicles, a veritable masterclass in the act of nonverbal acting, in the art of nonverbal acting, to the Dutchess County Courants, proves the old adage, there are no small roles, only small dogs. Favorite pastimes included chasing tennis balls and policemen on bicycles, growling at schnauzers, and rolling in the dirt after first getting thoroughly wet. He liked his gizzards with garlic and onion. Although averse on principle to performing such humiliating dog tricks as stay, heel, sit, etc., Bilbo did become quite adept at silently passing gas, staring down others reproachfully, and removing himself to a distance. He was a world traveler, having once vacationed in Switzerland, where he rode cable cars, swam in alpine lakes, and stayed at the Grand Hotel Giesbach, all done with great aplomb. Once his family acquired somewhat dubious service dog credentials for him, he was a regular at the Albany Symphony, Tanglewood Music Center, and Caramore Center for Music and the Arts. He leaves behind his father, Peter, mother, Anna, brother, Jamie, and a slew of tennis balls. Now, this was originally where I ended this tribute, but as I lived with it and it sat and I reread it over time, I thought, you know, I really am copping out and I am avoiding the real emotional truth of this event. I don't know whether I was, I didn't wanna go there. It was too painful to go there for me initially or whether I was uncomfortable making myself feel vulnerable by sharing what I really felt. But I, I finally realized that it was a cop out. So I went back and I revised the ending and I added one more line. So this is how the tribute now ends. He leaves behind his father, Peter, mother, Anna, brother, Jamie, and a slew of tennis balls and a hole as wide and deep as the Grand Canyon. So that was the first dog obituary I wrote and I posted it on Facebook so that I could share it with friends who had known Bilbo and to let them know that he had passed on. And uh, I was totally unprepared for the response I got. Uh, people wrote in that they just love this and they thought it was the funniest and most touching tribute to a pet they'd ever seen. And most importantly, they encouraged me to write a whole book of dog obituaries, which as I said, I'd never thought of doing. And so immediately I thought of all sorts of reasons why I couldn't possibly do that. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I don't know if I can write about somebody else's dog. 
you know, this was my beloved dog. He lived with our family for 10 years. I, I knew him intimately. How am I going to get to know a dog that perhaps I've never even met? Then where am I going to find my subjects? How am I going to get the stories of other dogs? How many obituaries does it take to make a book? You know, how many would I have to write? What'll be acceptable? Um, then I worried you can't, you can't write the same thing about every single dog. You have to find different things to say, different angles. You have to find different kinds of dogs. Uh, would I be able to come up with enough variety to make up a book, even, even a small book? I didn't know the answers to any of these questions, but I finally said to myself, Peter, uh, why don't you just give yourself permission to try? And if need be, give yourself permission to fail. Maybe you won't be able to do this, but how about you just write one obituary at a time as a dog story comes to you and see where it takes you and enjoy the journey. And maybe in the end, you'll have a book and maybe it won't be enough for a book. All will be revealed, but take the journey and enjoy it. And so that's what I decided to do. One of my earliest concerns was, you know, where am I going to get these stories from? How, how, am, I, how am I going to learn about these dogs? And so I, I decided pretty early on that I, I needed to basically be relentless. And everywhere I went, uh, hopefully if somebody asked me, or if not, if I could turn the conversation into that area, let people know I was writing this book and I needed more dog subjects and wanted to hear about dogs. And uh, so that's what I did. And uh, this next obituary that I'd like to read to you uh, comes from a wonderful, I think very special dog who uh, lived in England. So he was my first international subject for the book. Uh, I have his photo here, so you all can see. And his name was Stamford Nichols. And I got his story from a, a wonderful woman who had the terrible misfortune to be trapped on an airplane in the seat next to me on a two hour flight between London and Florence. And uh, as we got to talking and she eventually told me about her dog, Stanford, I, I knew that I, I had to write about him. I think you'll see his story is very special. Part of the challenge of coming up with variety is that I had to try to vary the tone of the obituaries. They all couldn't be exactly the same tone. So um, this one I think is a little bit more touching than hilarious. Uh, and I hope you'll enjoy it. Stamford Nichols. Stamford Nichols, the clairvoyant canine of ambiguous lineage belonging to Pam and Alan Nichols, has died in Great Britain at the age of 16, it was reported recently. The cause of death was bone cancer. Stamford's passing was peaceful and at home, where he was surrounded by his loving family. A veritable cornucopia of different breeds, with a soupçon of Bernese Mountain Dog thrown in for good measure, Stanford was adopted by the Nichols family from a local shelter. So he's also one of my, my few shelter dogs who's profiled. While not at all the size or breed of dog the family was intending to adopt, the dog looked so forlorn in his cage that the family took pity on him and gave him a sympathy walk big mistake. Once out of the cage, his boundless enthusiasm and irresistible smile won them over, far outweighing the severe flea allergy he had on his rump. Longstanding supporters of the Chelsea Football Club, whose stadium in Fulham is named Stamford Bridge, the family soon decided to christen their new dog Stamford. He was a regular bloke and the name suited him. Ironically, swimming rather than football turned out to be his primary athletic passion. 
On his first family outing, he unexpectedly wound up in a lake and appeared to be floundering. Alarmed, his adoptive mom dove in to save him and laboriously hauled him to safety. Imagine her surprise when, once on dry land, Stanford turned around and immediately jumped back in. By sheer serendipity, his new family happened to have their own swimming pool in which Stanford soon paddled around to his heart's content. He even learned to head towards the ladder and hang on with his front paws. Stanford was obsessed with balls and blessed with an exceptional memory. When the family visited friends in Normandy who owned a tennis court, Stanford was in seventh heaven. He spent hours foraging for old tennis balls in nearby fields and hedges, dutifully depositing them for tossing at the feet of the nearest human and chasing after them indefatigably. When said humans eventually tired of the game, invariably sooner than Stanford did, the ball was placed high atop a dresser in the kitchen, a clear signal that the game was over. A year later, upon a return visit, Stanford headed straight for the kitchen, sat down in front of the dresser, and tapped the door with his paw, eager to resume playing. Naturally gregarious, Stanford developed a unique form of greeting. He liked to stand on his hind legs, put his snout against one's nose, and breathe in and out rapidly into one's nostrils. In his travels, this was favorably received by both cattle and horses, if not always by humans. With humans, he liked to add a dirty sock to the mix, making the olfactory experience that much more memorable. Stanford was faithful, happy, loving, and adaptable. Nine months after his arrival, his family adopted a young puppy they named Rudy, in tribute to the Chelsea football manager, Rude Gullet. When Rudy turned out to be the alpha male, Stanford accepted his new role in the pecking order with equanimity, and the two dogs, familiarly known as the boys, became inseparable. They were two mongrel dogs rescued from a North London shelter, reveling together in their good fortune. More than any other distinguishing trait, Stanford displayed extraordinary sensitivity and empathy, almost a sixth sense, if you will. When the Nichols tragically lost their only daughter in a freak gap year accident, Stanford instinctively intuited the depth of their despair. He always knew when Pam's grief was at its worst and would come find her wherever she had withdrawn, sit down quietly beside her and lean against her. Eventually, the family decided to get away to Australia and brought the boys with them. Their devotion, exuberance, and need for daily care proved to be a healing balm. For the journey, Stanford acquired his own passport. It should be noted he never felt his photo did him justice. And a custom-made crate. Once down under, he adapted quickly to his new surroundings, making the transition from chasing squirrels to chasing kangaroos without batting an eye. If he ever wondered why Australian squirrels were so bloody big and bouncy, he never mentioned it. Stanford's sensitivity extended not only to humans, but to animals as well. When Rudy was nine, he was diagnosed with inoperable leukemia. The family had returned to England by then, and as the end approached, Rudy was laid in his bed outside in the garden where the family could sit and stroke him. When the vet arrived to put him down, Pam and Stanford withdrew inside the house where they could neither see nor hear what was happening. Moments later, Stanford threw his head back and let out a blood curdling primal howl, a sound he had never made before. Rudy was gone. 
The epitome of man's best friend, Stanford will be sorely missed. One can only hope that the boys have been reunited at last, two mongrel mates out on an eternal romp. So that is Stanford. I think I mentioned earlier that I felt a real need to try to come up with, invent as much variety as I could. And the more obituaries I wrote, the harder and harder that became to think of something new. So I, I tried, to about, tried to write about all different kinds of dogs. I, I don't repeat any pure breeds. Um, I tried to find dogs whose basic characteristics were different. Uh, I tried to vary the tone of the piece. As I said, some were more overtly funny than others. Um, I did want this to be a celebration and not a downer. And finally, I realized that I could try to vary the style I was writing in. And uh, I had a wonderful opportunity for this when I went back to my college hometown to rehearse and then perform in the 65th anniversary concert of my college's, my acapella singing group. And during a break in one of those rehearsals, I was chatting with um, a fellow that had sung with me during the years I was in school. And he naively asked me what I was doing these days. So I, I had to tell him and he said, oh, you should write about my last dog. He was really bad. And my ears just picked up. I thought, that's fantastic. I don't, I don't have a really bad dog yet. Tell me all about him. And so he did. And, and by then, actually a long time before, actually I had realized I needed to create a questionnaire to send to people so that I would be sure to ask the kind of questions that would help me understand and get to know their dog. Um, and so the, the more I learned about this dog, Tigger Knapp, um, I was reminded of the, the famous 17th century English novel, later made into an Academy Award winning movie, Tom Jones. I don't know if any of you will be familiar with the book or will have seen the wonderful movie um, starring Albert Finney. But um, I, I felt that that, that style, the style of Tom Jones was very fitting to tell the story of Tigger Knapp. Here is uh, Tigger's photo. And I worked very hard with the dog owners to find a photo that was revealing of their dog and that hopefully would relate to what I was writing about them. So. Um, I thought this was a particularly appropriate photo uh, with one very strong characteristic. So here is Tigger Knapp. Tigger Knapp, the incorrigible golden Labrador, frequently referred to as bad dog, has died in Anchorage, Alaska after a lifetime devoted to misdeeds and miscreants. As is regrettably so common in cases like this, he lived to the ripe old age of 15 and enjoyed every moment of his shameful misspent life. Acquired by the Knapp family at the tender age of 10 months, the puppy, originally named Tanner, displayed exceptional bounce and vigor inspiring them to rechristen him Tigger. His excessive exuberance was attributed to his youth. Little did one know how challenging the dog would prove to be. As with Tom Jones, the foundling, not the singer, it was the universal opinion of all who came to know him that this handsome reprobate was born to be hanged. Just how nefarious were his deeds? We shall attempt to catalog them here. Riotous disturbance of the peace. Tigger had the unsettling habit of barking at all times, on all occasions, at any provocation. If the doorbell rang, he would bark. 
If someone walked down the street outside his house, he would bark. If there was another dog in the neighbor's yard, he would bark and then run back and forth along the fence, barking at it. If he heard a sound in the night, he would bark and wake up his family. If he was hungry or lonely, he would bark. If his family went for a row in their boat at the lake, he would stand on the dock and bark. Even a bark collar did little to curb this lamentable tendency. Stealing candy from small children. Tigger had a voracious appetite, which extended to moose droppings and holiday candy. In regard to the latter, he was fortunate enough to grow up in a household with three children. He was inordinately fond of chocolate. Woe to the careless child who left their chocolate Santa or Easter bunny within his reach. These were swiftly decapitated and devoured, foil wrapping and all. Slavish devotion to his baser instincts. Tigger was an inveterate humper of male dogs, pretty much every single one he met. He pursued this abomination devotedly and was not easily discouraged. It could take a good 10 minutes of shouting, pulling, pleading, and crying to affect disengagement. He was shameless and had no regrets. Thievery. Ticker had a compulsion to steal various articles of clothing and had a particular penchant for the odd mitten or cap. Once he stole an item, it was challenging to get him to relinquish it. When people chased after him, he thought they were playing a game. Since he lived in Alaska, where the temperature was often sub-zero, the person whose hat or mitten he had absconded with was normally not amused. Contempt for law and order. Tigger evidenced an almost total lack of control from the earliest age. An attempt to enroll him in obedience training was a dismal failure, and he was summarily expelled for his nonstop barking and classroom disruption. Other examples of his disregard for authority included his family's inability to stop him from begging at the dining room table, their inability to get him to come when called, except when he felt like it, and their inability to get him to stay in the back seat of the car. He would constantly try to clamber over into the front seat, all the while barking enthusiastically in the driver's ear. Carousing and debauchery. Tigger would take every opportunity he could to escape his confines, be it from the backyard, the car, or the garage, and run off on a wild spree. He would then disappear for an hour or two, or four. An entire evening could be consumed driving around the neighborhood looking for him. Eventually, he would stagger home, bloated from having gorged himself on the contents of a neighbor's trash can. This would frequently be followed by his vomiting on the carpet. Poaching. Jigger seemed to have a real bloodlust for small animals, such as the neighbor's cat, which mercifully always escaped him, birds, marmots, which usually got away, porcupines, who needed no admonishment to stand and deliver, thereby twice necessitating visits to the pet emergency room, and regrettably a neighbor's pet bunnies, two of which he killed. When he actually caught an animal or found a dead one, he would carry it home victoriously, but refused to release it from his tightly clenched jaws. Often one person had to spray him in the face with a water bottle, another had to pry his jaws open, and a third had to use two sticks to extract the carcass. Selfishness. Tigger had an unfortunate habit of timing his medical emergencies to coincide with holidays when it was harder to find an open vet clinic, more expensive to be treated, and guaranteed to disrupt the family celebration. These included the infamous Christmas party brownies incident, 
in which Tigger devoured a quadruple batch of brownies down to the last crumb with disastrous digestive consequences. The aforementioned porcupine quill spearings, which occurred over a variety of holidays, and a memorable Memorial Day run, during which Tigger ran into, rather than was hit by, a car, resulting in the loss of a toe. In the final reckoning, more money was spent on Tigger's emergency vet visits than on all of the family's three children's medical visits over the course of their entire childhood. Add to these an unrepentant tendency to steal any food left unattended, an impulse to herd family members while they were skiing, causing innumerable wipeouts, an unfortunate tendency towards flatulence and not infrequent household accidents. And it should be clear that this was a very bad dog indeed. In all Christian charity, it should be noted that Tigger did have some redeeming qualities. First, he was handsome. Well, not exactly a tribute to his character, it did make it easier to forgive his transgressions. He could be very affectionate and enjoyed lying by one's side on the sofa or bed while one was reading. When he sensed a family member was in pain, Tigger would remain steadfastly nearby all day. He loved his family and was delighted to join in their outdoor activities, early morning jogs and mountain hikes in particular. He was a happy dog, always wagging his tail, maddeningly oblivious to the chaos he created all around him. One way or another, Tigger made his presence felt. Although an easy act to follow with almost any successor guaranteed to appear saintly by comparison, Tigger will be missed. There is a terrible stillness that descends on a house when a dog has died, more deafening than any barking. A private celebration of his life is in the planning stages. Fittingly, brownies will be served. So that, I hope, will give you um, a feel for my book, A Dog's Life. Uh, I, as I said, I think there are a total of 23 real dogs who I've profiled, and I tried to give you a sense of a variety of shelter dogs and purebred dogs and American dogs and English dogs and um, some tributes funnier than others, others perhaps a little bit more... Um, touching or poignant, I hope. 